So this past Friday, I went to Blumfest 2023, which is almost like a Blumhouse themed horror film festival hosted where else but Universal Orlando. There we got to experience some exclusive screenings, some photo opportunities, and a Q&A with not only the creative team behind Halloween Horror Nights, which has pretty close ties to Blumhouse, but also someone who worked on Blumhouse's most recent film, The Exorcist Believer, which also came out on the day of Blumfest. So how was the event? What did we do? Well, stay tuned to find out because this video is all about Blumfest 2023, my experience, what I thought about it, and whether it was worth it. And honestly, I think it was. If you're new to the channel, hello, my name is Aiden. This is Dreamport Productions, where we talk about Halloween Horror Nights a lot, as well as just Universal Orlando generally, uh, history, lore, fun facts. So if you like that kind of stuff, leave a like and subscribe to the channel, of course. It would be truly appreciated. So yeah, Blumfest what a whirlwind of an event now this is a free event again hosted at universal orlando not inside the theme parks but rather at the movie theater located at the front of city walk yeah already the crowd building for blumfest i have a feeling this is going to be a really really popular one tickets sold out like within hours and even though they did a second drop they still sold out within hours so it's going to be a busy one i got to city walk around nine o'clock in the morning and there was already a pretty good line of people that were there check-in wasn't until 10 a.m and once we got checked in, we were given a badge with the itinerary on the back, as well as a complimentary Five Nights at Freddy's themed button. I'm going to talk about Five Nights at Freddy's quite a bit during this video because that is an upcoming Blumhouse release that we did get quite a few little teasers for at Blumfest. But back to that badge, you'll notice that there's sort of a green overlay on this badge, and that'll be important a little later. There were a couple different badges that you could get, a green and a purple for just guests, and that determined what time you were sort of operating in the event. Uh, more when it came to the photo ops and the Q&A, where one group would go into the Q&A first and the other would go into the photo op first. And let me just say, I think this is really, really smart. Of course, the Q&A is going to be the most popular thing. It's the most direct connection to Halloween Horror Nights at this event. And this event was full of Halloween Horror Nights fans, naturally. So it was a good way of sort of keeping the crowds low, not having a bunch of people flooding into the first Q&A. But the same also went for the photo ops. But I'm getting ahead of myself. That was not the first thing we did. The first thing we did was got seated for our exclusive screening of Megan, the Unrated Edition. Now, I'm not someone who is a big fan fan of the Megan movie. It's just not really for me. But of course, since we have Megan at Halloween Horror Nights this year in the form of the Horde in the streets, it makes sense that we're seeing this movie this year. I had never seen the unrated cut before going into this event. I knew there were only a few tweak differences, but I don't know, the unrated cut just made the whole experience a whole lot better. Plus, we had a pretty sizable group at this point of horror fans in general laughing along with the movie. I have kind of an appreciation for it. At least I created a sort of a memory around Megan at this event. But after Megan came the thing that I was super excited for, and that of course was the Q&A with the Halloween Horror Nights creative team, or a couple members of the Halloween Horror Nights creative team. It's not just these guys. And rather than me just talk about it, let me show you some of the q and I didn't film the entire thing. If you wanna watch the Q&A in its entirety, I will link that in the description down below. But yeah, let's just hop over and take a look at some of the highlights. Welcome to the fourth annual Blumfest RC second in person. It's good to see you guys. Last year we had an incredible panel of creatives here to speak with you all and today is not going to be any different. You're in for a real treat. Please help me welcome to the stage the senior show director for Halloween Horror Nights, Charles Gray. <laughs> the assistant director of the creative development group and show direction, Laura Souls. And of course, Senior Director of Creative Development, Mike Aiello. Yeah, the, this was probably one of the most unique creative processes we've ever had um, for one of our haunted houses. Um, given the fact that uh, I got the script for The Exorcist Believer uh, back in, I guess, maybe August of 2022, and read it, um, did some highlights of some things that could be appropriate for what we know a haunted house needs to be, because again, that application, the adaptation is very specific. Um, and it was actually a year ago yesterday that I sent the script to Charles and Laura with just, again, just a, a, a assortment of just thoughts and, and highlights throughout that script of, of what we felt 
could be something to attach to uh, from the script itself. Again, no footage, no photography, just the written word is how the process started. And once we created that framework, uh, it was parallel path, I would say, with while we were shooting, we were creating. So we would get access to day of pictures off the set, which was really fascinating. So you may have a conception of what is on the page, what it looks like in your mind, and then within a day see what it actually was on set. And that, that was exciting. How did you pick what sound bites and stuff that you wanted to use in the house you know, to help build this story when you had such limited knowledge going into it. Exciting for me was that we actually got to use the uh, tubular bells. Yes. Um, there was, there's a portion of it, a, a remix of it that to me is, is great when you walk in the house and you hear that reminder. Um, and then also there's some dialogue that we got to use from the film that was really interesting. Um, girls screaming is always scary. So, uh, <laughs> Another really unique thing about the process was we knew going into the creative development of it that our haunted house was going to open well before the film released. So that also places a very unique opportunity and, and a challenge on the creative process. Yeah, we knew going into this that we would open, like Mike said, several weeks earlier. So we knew we wanted to do this living, breathing trailer for the film so that you all would get as excited about it as we are when we read the script. There is some sets that when I was watching, I was like, wow, we, we did it. Like, we're, we're there, we're there. So uh, it, it's exciting to see those moments. But that, that's a testament to the design team who is not here on stage with us to be able to take all of that reference photography and, and a lot of it isn't even from the camera angles that are in the film. This is someone on set literally just documenting all of the set pieces, all of the props, all of the, the costuming. Um, and so our team then, then takes those assets and has to decipher them, not only for what we think is gonna be of value for the experience, but at the same time, adapt it for the viewpoints that we know our guests are gonna end up walking through, which in some cases is identical to what the film approaches. In other cases, we do, we're malleable with some of the set pieces so that we can ensure that you, the audience, is the camera at that point and getting the best shot and view of whatever scene is being um, uh, created. We were so excited that we got to bring um, this Megan horde of dancers to life, right? We had an incredible choreographer, Stephanie Robbins, who was inspired by just the taste of what Megan did in the film. Um, we got to use the music. Um, it just it came together so brilliantly. And we know we don't tell you what time they're coming out. We know that's a thing, but we do that purposefully so we don't block up our streets and, and, and cause a pinch point in our flow of traffic. Um, but we know you all know where they're at because we see you sitting in their locations for hours on den waiting on them um, but no we are extremely happy as how much you all love it because we love it ourselves and the girls are just incredible and Charles Gray is actually really good at the choreography he was doing a little yeah, bit I, I was stage. disappointed I made it all the way up to the finals and then they cut me but uh, you would have so looked great in the wig I would have been all real hot <laughs> but I guess the biggest difference is when we have an intellectual property we have most of the time assets to look at in this scenario of exorcist believer we had script we had photos coming in we didn't have as many assets as we usually do um, but for like stranger things 4 we had the assets for that um, we had the ability to do that so again it's just making sure we have the assets and and all the information we need to do an intellectual property haunted house um, from an original content standpoint we all are honest with ourselves. We love doing those. <laughs> we love creating those original stories. Um, but the process is very much the same. Um, we make sure we're, we have the team of creators in the room and we're all kind of spitballing ideas. Um, we also like to say that typically we, none of us know who created the idea for our original content because we're all creating it together. Um, we say that all the time, but really the processes are the same. Um, it's just making sure we have those assets for the intellectual property. I, I usually have like a, a favorite house and then a surprise house, a house that surprised me. Last year, Black Phone completely surprised me because I wasn't sure if the audience was gonna respond to, you know, just that singular killer. And it was awesome. Like when I went through there, I, it, it was 
a rare moment where I was very creeped out because I've seen a lot. But it, that house last year really creeped me out, the black phone section. I have a history with Jack because it, I did the very first show. I choreographed the very first show that we saw Jack in. Not Jack that you all know. He was a little bit of a dancer <laughs> and a cafe widow. He was Buff Jack. Um, that was in 2001 before we knew how popular Jack would become. Um, so I have a little bit of a history with him. So Jack holds a good place in my heart. And then I will say creating Dr. Oddfellow was absolutely an honor to do. Like from the time all of us were sitting talking about, we've never seen this character, we can develop this character, we can make this character his own and have an iconic status. We didn't go into this creating an icon. We went into creating Dr. Oddfellow that could potentially have icon status. And Dr. Oddfellow has done the rest himself. We did the prequel of the thing several years ago. Um, we've never done the original. You're stealing my mic. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Quick story. First time I ever saw the thing was at Charles Gray's house. Years ago, we used to work at Game Lab together over at Nickelodeon. That was the first time I ever saw the thing at, uh, at his house. And it was like, this is the greatest thing ever. <laughs> uh, original wise, uh, one of the first houses I worked on was Dollhouse of the Damned. And I just loved it, and I feel like there's so much more story there, so maybe someday in the future, somewhere. But don't, that, that's, yeah. that's a cool house. Mm -hmm. it, it, it makes an impact. This character makes a definitive impact to the event in some way. Um, that, that becomes an iconic status. Again, Oddfellow. I would say Boris is an icon because that is a major impact in the event. Pumpkin it, Lore. Pumpkin Lore is an icon. <laughs> he was your front door. You know, you started as a character in the house, and then again, to Laura's point, you all made, elevated that character to make us go, we gotta make him the guy that says, hey everybody, come on in, you know? <laughs> I should have put that line That was the original script, actually. That was the original script. Uh, we are very collaborative with um, the Hollywood team, John Murdy and his, his amazing creative team. Um, so early in the process, we're, we're very much aligned. So we, we, we in Orlando really like to, whenever possible, stick to a five and five, whenever possible. Um, so that would be a reason why we didn't do Evil Dead here this year is because we really felt we wanted to do these five original houses. And, and Orlando is, is different than Hollywood in, in, in that structure. Um, we, we very much want to lean into the original content just as much as we are the intellectual properties. So to keep that kind of 50-50 balance when possible. There have been years we've, been, we've done six and four, like we have done that, because there was a very good reason why, whether it was we really believed in that brand and really wanted to bring that to the table, as well as the other five IPs. But really, again, five and five, we, we try and stick with as much as possible. So that, that is the, the real reason. Well, I mean, there, there, are, there are always white whales, as we call them, as far as IPs are concerned, that are still out there that we haven't been able to adapt yet. So I, I really can't speak to those because they might be things we end up doing in the future. But as far as originals, that, that's the really wonderful thing about the original content is um, that's probably the most freeing part of the creative process for us because it really is just our teams in a room throwing everything at the table or at the board. And, and really, it's, we're, it's a um, curse of riches at that point because there's so many different things, so many different ideas, so many different characters and environments that, that we haven't really done before. Or juxtaposition is also a really unique aspect of the creative process of what, are there things that we can bring, things that are seemingly disseparate that we can bring together and, and make something out of. Um, so it's not really anything that we haven't been able to do, it's that we haven't done it yet, you know? Um, well, thank you all again so much for coming out and answering your questions. Everyone, one more time for Charles Gray, Laura Sauls, and Mike Gaia. Thank you. Thank you. You have been working with uh, director David Gordon Green for a while now. Do you remember when you two met? Yeah, I met him at a dinner party, and we were talking, and then he grabbed the knife from the dinner table and said, I'm going to stab you. <laughs> and I said, okay. <laughs> That's very on brand for both of you, yes. truthfully. Without any spoilers, because they haven't seen it yet, and not just this film, but maybe any of your work, do you feel like you have a scene that when people are going to bring up your name, 
they're going to think of. With Halloween, I could say what it is because it's been out for so long. Like when Michael Myers is at the insane asylum and the, uh, the guy brings it the mask and says, like, that's iconic. And that's a whole fun story in itself. This movie, there's a sequence with uh, Ellen where she confronts that demon that we saw in the trailer. She says, I know who you are. That I think we did a pretty good job on. I think it'll be t-shirts and memes and stuff like that. And, you know, <laughs> They're like, yes, we've already bought some. I hope so. I, I think it's pretty cool. We've worked on Halloween and The Exorcist, two films you probably watched as a kid. How do you feel, like, how do you reflect working on those two powerhouses of a franchise? This is scary stuff. I mean, I mean, like, career scary. You know, you get a... I, I come from film school, and, you know, I like all movies, and I'm, I just recently saw Guardians of the Galaxy 3, and I thought it was the best thing I've ever seen. You know, I, and I like small films. Um, getting involved with horror is scary, because there's a rabid fan base, and there's a lot of crap. You know, especially in the years of my childhood coming up. You know, there's a lot of subpar sequels. And I did all three of the, extra, of the Halloweens because I didn't think anybody else would care as much as I did going into those uh, two and three. And same with The, the Exorcist. That, like, you can't phone this stuff in. You have got to really care about it. As you could see, that was a really cool q and I, I love Q&As and sort of getting to see the behind the scenes aspect of Halloween Horror Nights specifically in this case, uh, but just anything in general. I love seeing sort of the creative process that goes into stuff. So listening to Mike Aiello and Laura Sauls and Charles Gray sort of talk about the process behind some of the Blumhouse related projects for this year and past years, as well as just general Halloween Horror Nights stuff, past houses, icons, was just really, really great. It was a really great time. We were lucky enough to get front row which was great for seeing that Megan Horde in the beginning which is super hard to see in the park so I was super excited to get a good video of it for you all and then of course getting to hear from the DP of the Exorcist Believer was really really great and sort of gave a little bit of a teaser for the movie and the visual style of that film so yeah all around great Q&A uh, but next it was time for the exclusive photo op experience which I totally had no clue what was going to be. So while the Q&A was located at the Rising Stars or a karaoke bar in CityWalk, the photo op experience was located right next to Fat Tuesday. You sort of enter through the Blum House, which I think is a really, really cool detail, into the first sort of sectioned off area, which is themed to, of course, the Exorcist Believer. You can get a really cool levitating bed shot. I did get one of those. I had to get one of those levitating bed shots for the Exorcist Believer. And I really like that they had this flashing red light effect as you would go sort of sporadically. They do a lot of flashing light effects in this Blum House photo op experience. Moving ahead to the next room, it was themed to Megan. This was probably the least intricate photo op experience, in my opinion. I know they have since added a Megan uh, character that does come out here because I got—I guess I should say this Blumhouse experience is now just open to the public. Um, it was debuted at the Blumfest event, but now it has opened to the public uh, from about 3 to 11 on most nights in CityWalk. So if you're in the area, go check it out. It's right next to Fat Tuesday. But yeah, the Megan experience was really cool and you sort of can dance with it as you can see in this clip. We're kind of dancing along to it and the lights flash. It's, 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 it's cute. It's a cute thing that matches the tone of Megan. The next room though was my favorite and it is the black phone now the black phone is probably my favorite Blumhouse movie if I'm being honest and I just love how this room is laid out you get to see all the black balloons and the black phone itself against this grungy wall with the black phone logo above it but I think the coolest part are the lighting effects which sort of flash on and show the face of the grabber along the walls I think this is really great the most intricate one in my opinion and again I might be biased because I love the black phone movie but I really really loved this photo op i got my fair share of photos in here while we were at the event and i talked about five nights at freddy's and well that final room is the five nights at freddy's photo op room you got the characters out front you have all these tvs playing clips from the trailers which i think is a nice little touch i think this is one of the more aesthetically pleasing photo ops i guess of the set and yeah i think overall this photo op experience was really cool and i love that it's now open for all guests to experience i feel like it kind of would have been a waste if they had just 
just done this for the one day of Blumfest. So I think this is a nice little way to experience Halloween and Halloween Horror Nights without actually going into the park. And maybe if you're a little scared to see Halloween Horror Nights, but you still want some cool pics, uh, you could go in here and uh, you'll have a good time. From there, we made our way back to the theater to see The Exorcist Believer, which had just dropped that day. And while I'm not gonna dive into deep spoilers of The Exorcist Believer because the movie did just come out, I did enjoy this movie quite a bit. Now, while I can't say the movie's like my favorite horror movie or even my favorite Blumhouse movie, I think it's a pretty solid film. Now, I mentioned before that this film has a very specific visual style, and I think that's one of the big standout moments. It was a beautiful looking movie. The girls in there, both Angela and Catherine, really, really sell the sort of possession aspect. And Leslie Odom Jr. steals the show. He, he, he's fantastic in this role. Uh, yeah, he absolutely steals the show in this movie. And this next little bit may or may not kind of contain some spoilers. I'm gonna be talking about the haunted house at HHN. So there's more spoilers for the haunted house, uh, more of like what's in the haunted house that's not in the movie or vice versa. First of all, there is no fecal matter present in the film like it is in the haunted house. That is such a big part of the haunted house, uh, for better or for worse when it comes to the immersion. But yeah, like the whole mother thing that's in the haunted house is nowhere really to be seen in the movie. I believe it was in the movie, but it was like cut. You really get to see the demon and the way hell is presented in the house is very, very different um, from the movie. You do get to see the demon in the movie, um, but you get more of a look at them in the haunted house. There is a lot of stuff, mostly dialogue lines and like visual cues that are present in both the film and the haunted house, but you could see where they do take some creative liberties. I personally think I prefer the house. If we are making like comparisons, it's really hard to compare because they're two completely different mediums. But yeah, that was my experience at Blumfest 2023. Lots of obviously promo for Five Nights at Freddy's and as well as The Exorcist. This is really an event that celebrates Blumhouse, but also is there to kind of promote their upcoming releases and uh, stuff that recently came out. So obviously Megan, Five Nights at Freddy's, Exorcist, those are the three big titles we had a lot of uh, coverage with. But of course, things like the Black Phone had some presence there as well. Overall, what did I think of the event? For a free event, I thought it was pretty awesome. They had a lot of stuff to do between the two free movie screenings, the Q&A and the photo ops. We were pretty much busy the entire time. We didn't have a whole lot of downtime. I thought everything was really well organized. As I mentioned before, with sort of the ID badge cards, um, they did a really good job at sort of managing capacity, managing crowds, because this was a pretty popular event, I think way more popular than last year's. And I think as this event grows, it's gonna get more and more popular as the years go on. Kudos to the team working the event. You guys are absolutely awesome. All the team members were doing great. And yeah, just kudos to Universal and Blumhouse for putting together this sort of fan event. A lot of it is advertisement for their upcoming movies, but it's also great for us horror, Horror Nights fans, Blumhouse fans to celebrate the fandom, get together and have a good time watching some horror movies. So with that, I'm gonna wrap it up here. I know it's not directly like Horror Nights related. I mean, it is, but, but it's not. But regardless, I hope you enjoyed this video. What is your favorite Blumhouse movie. I mentioned mine is The Black Phone, but are you a Purge fan? Do you like The Sinisters? Let me know in the comments below. I shot a bunch of videos this weekend, so they're gonna kind of be coming out sporadically. We have some vlogs from HHN, Unmasking the Horror, so you're gonna wanna stay tuned for all that stuff if you like Halloween Hornets videos. Anyways, I wanna thank you all for watching this video again. I truly appreciate it, and I, of course, will see you all in the next one. Take care, everybody. Okay.